God is right where you are. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. So wherever you find yourself today, God is with you. He's promised to be with you. And we're so glad that you are with us today. This is Hope Today. I'm Tom Hollis, and here's Amy Schaefer, fresh back from Cuba. Cuba and Alaska. <laughs> and Alaska. I was in Alaska. Coming at you today. Today we are going to uncover one of my favorite subjects of all times, the secret to lasting joy. We're going to redefine happiness and triumphing over adversity. Did you know you could have joy in adversity? Experiencing a worry defeating, circumstance defying happiness. That is why I can't wait to talk to Randy Frazee about his new book, The Joy Challenge. I'm all in with the joy challenge Tom. i love that i love the joy i'm, I'm all about defeat you know things getting defeated <laughs> depression defeating all yes, that kind of stuff on. it's fantastic and we have another guest for you if you have been around the body of christ a little while you've heard of promise keepers and what a powerful move of god promise keepers was in so many of our lives as men of God and Shane Winnings is the CEO of promise keepers. He's going to be with us. He's got an amazing story himself. I want him to tell his story, but also his vision for where promise keepers is going. You know, Amy, I always think of the big a gathering in Washington, D.C. in 1997. That was one week before I started here at Cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And it was just the most incredible time of men coming together. And our, uh, you know, Shane has got so much that he wants to share about the new vision for Promise Keepers. I love it. You know, I remember my dad going to many Promise Keepers meetings, and I love what God is doing with the men. I love what God is doing with the women and the church. Right now, I love what God is doing with joy. Randy Frazee is a respected pastor and author and in-depth knowledge and research on the subject of finding joy. He joins us to shed some light on how we can find happiness and contentment regardless of our circumstances. That's huge, Pastor Randy. Welcome to Hope Today. My privilege to be with you. Hope to bring you some joy. Is that why joy is a challenge? Because we do face circumstances and challenges in life? Yeah, I've titled the book The Joy Challenge kind of in a, uh, looking at it in, a, in two ways. Number one, uh, it is extremely challenging. It's always been challenging, but it's particularly challenging today given the circumstances we're living in. So yeah, joy is not going to come to you automatically. You're going to need to apply the principles found in God's Word to get there through the power of God's Spirit within you. But I also put the book in the form of a challenge. So it's a 25-day challenge. So it's kind of a, a both end. I love that there are boxes that you can check off for day one, yes. day two, all the way through. I've already checked off many boxes in this book. Um, why joy? Are you passionate about joy? Did you struggle with joy? Why did the subject of joy impact you so much? Well, like like a pastor, uh, you know, many of us have taught through the book of Philippians. We've taught on the subject of joy. We know our people need it. So I've been teaching, you know, on this subject for the 35 years I've been a pastor. And uh, but it was, you know, from the COVID experience, uh, I was already under contract with Thomas Nelson uh, to write this book. Uh, and then uh, we delayed it to make it my last book. COVID hits. And then just the escalation of the need for this book rose like never before. The truth is, I, I pastor a church in the Kansas City and the state of Kansas. And uh, we were rated uh, last, dead last, 51, including Washington, D.C., in struggling with depression and anxiety. The place where, uh, you know, uh, you know, Dorothy and Toto are from. There's no place like home, which means mid-American, everything safe and fine and apple pie is actually struggling more than any other state. And so uh, bringing this to the congregation I serve, uh, surprisingly, uh, because of their uh, of their struggle. Uh, and then I have struggled with joy. I've had two serious bouts of depression in my life, not just gloominess. And so uh, I was looking deeply for uh, an opportunity to find a joy that wasn't uh, dependent upon my circumstances. Let's dive into those studies a little bit more on joy because you unpack those even at the beginning of the book, the happiest places in the world, you know, our reality versus sort of our expectations. How do we judge and navigate this um, joy level, if that's what you call it? 
Yes, um, it's really interesting. For years now, there's been a, a world study on the happiest people, and the Nordic people have been the ones, you know, like fin Finland and, and, and Denmark have been at the very top of the pile for years. And I read an article by a Finnish guy. He goes, this, is cannot, this cannot possibly be. We are not the happiest people in the world. So what they ended up doing in the uh, – what he uncovered, they were doing in the study, they were asking you, what is your expectation – for experiencing joy. What's your highest expectation and where are you currently at there? Well, as it turns out, according to this article, uh, in the culture of the Nordic people, which is a place where it's very, very cold, which I think is a very difficult circumstance to have lots of joy in. All you, and I know you guys are in Pittsburgh. I was born uh, in Uniontown, so I know what cold is all about. And uh, so it's, it's the difference between what your expectation is and where you're actually at. Uh, Nordic people have a tendency of lowering their expectation. So the gap between their expectation and where they're at is pretty, pretty tight. And that's what makes them the happiest people in the world. So it's a little bit of a head fake. In America, we have the expectation that we can be the happiest people on the planet. You can be the president of the United States. You can be rich. You can be happy. And then when we measure where we're at in relationship to it, the gap is bigger, which is why Americans are a, a bit struggling. With both places, whether it's the Nordic people or Americans, their joy is dependent upon their evaluation of their circumstances. And what God's word offers is a kind of joy that's despite that. You know, Randy, that, that brings a question to mind. Uh, what about Christians? Christians would tend to have this high level of expectation of joy. Is that what uh, maybe we struggle with as well? We have this really, you know, we're Christians. We're, we're saved. We're, we're bought by the blood of the Lamb. We are redeemed. We should, we feel like we should be up here. But we have a, we have a prayer line here. and We have a lot of people that call mostly Christians who are struggling with that. Yeah, you know, what? It, what's really interesting, and I appreciate you ans asking uh, that, is that we as Christians should have a high expectation of joy. But in order to reach it, we need to rediscover a kind of joy that is not dependent upon our circumstances, people, and our past, and one that gives way to worry. And the principles of God's Word, in the power of God's Spirit, helps us to apply those principles so that we actually get closer to the ultimate expectation that we can have. I need you to unpack those joy robbers, those joy thieves. I mean, circumstances, worry. I mean, I, I come from world-class worriers. I almost feel like I'm helping the Lord by worrying. But it does, it sucks the joy right out of you. I mean, how do we combat those when they come, the robbers and the thieves? Yeah, the robbers are, I, you know, and I, I take this, uh, all of my principles from the book of Philippians. Chapter one, he talks about joy despite your circumstances. You got to keep in mind that Paul is under house arrest when he's writing this book, right? So his circumstances are not great. That should alarm us. He has this amazing type of joy. Theologians call this the treatise on joy. He's writing it from a place that's not the petri dish for positivity, is it? Uh, the other one is people. People are big joy robbers in our life, and I've been that for other people I know, so it's not just a blame game. Then there's our past. Many people, either what's happened to them or what they did, they can't get beyond that. It could even be their success that's keeping them from joy because they can't find a new level of success. They've peaked out. Or just the opportunity to worry. I appreciate what you said. For me, sometimes I feel like if I worry, the thing won't happen. And it's just absolutely poor thinking on my part. So um, what Paul is going to give us in these principles we're unfolding, 20 principles on how to have joy despite them. Because if you continue to pursue a joy that is dependent upon those circumstances, you're never going to be happy because we have to find a way to live above them. My uh, professor in seminary used to say, um, hey, um, I would ask somebody, how are you doing? And they would oftentimes respond, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. And then he would quit back, well, what are you doing under there for? And I think that's the, for the Christian, we're going to have to find a way to live with the reality. We live in a broken world. We're going to have people and circumstances and things in our past that are going to continue to carry us great opportunities to worry. But he's going to give us principles on how to rise above it. Randy, you mentioned that you've had battles with joy. Is there one particular circumstance that you could share with us, maybe just one that you could pick out where you struggled but you overcame? 
Yeah, um, I'll, uh, w- uh, probably one of the biggest ones in my life, and uh, many, many people that are watching, I can pr- probably identify this one. I went through a, a, a unexpected betrayal from about three friends. And, um, I, you know, in my life, I had been criticized and betrayed, but these were close friends. And as a result, I didn't see it coming. And a uh, neurologist would tell you that I went into the middle part of my brain, the amygdala, where I was entering into, you know, that fight freeze or flight and i stayed down there there too long trying to fix my own problem and as a result when i wanted to come back up because i was so anxious uh, i had stayed down there too long and someone shut the door and i couldn't get back to the top again Mm -hmm. and so paul's principles uh, have really helped me out. As a matter of fact, it was my medical doctor who helped me understand some of those. I, can I share one of the one of them? One of them, maybe. Yeah, yes, is that a good absolutely. idea? Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just. Share, I mean, I can share all twenty of them because I think it's a combination of all twenty uh, made into spiritual disciplines that will raise your joy. But one little time, and they're very accessible. So in the very beginning of Philippians, Paul uh, says that he is praying with joy. Uh, recalling memories that he had of the Philippians, and it, and, it, and, and it brought him joy. He prayed with joy. Well, what we now know in modern neuroscience of the last 10 to 15 years is that there's a place in our brain called the hippocampus where we store our memories, where God has created for us to store our memories. And whenever, listen to this, whenever you recall a memory, that memory gets stronger, that memory gets stronger. So if you make it a habit in prayer to recall happy memories of people in your past, Philippians in your life who were very encouraging to Paul, what's going to happen? It's going to bring that memory file uh, to mind. It's going to strengthen that memory and give you a jolt of hope and of joy despite what you're currently dealing with. And so I have pictures all in my office here. I could scan it and show you of pictures of people in my past who are the Philippians in my life, and particularly in the morning when I'm feeling that anxiousness of the day, I'll pull one of them down and I'll recall that memory, the sights, the sounds, how they believed in me, how they accept me for who I am and and love me for who I am. And I thank God for them and joy. And, And neurologically, that's going to lift you up and give you joy despite what you're facing today. And that's one of the things that I did, not instantly, not overnight, but over time, applying the principles of God's word has enabled me to find joy despite those circumstances. I love that so much. And I was kind of giggling as I was reading through your book because my husband has said the words the past couple of weeks, your cerebral frontal cortex or vortex, whatever in your brain. He's like, Amy, you've got to quit thinking about that. I'm like... You mentioned it in your book that science backs up what Paul is teaching us about joy. So if you had like one home run thought for us today about joy and what we're thinking about, how it affects our life, what would that be? I think the number one that I would pick out is the principle where Paul uh, talks. Well, you know, I, I'm going to pick a different one. Um, let me let me pick it. They're all really good. I'm so know, sorry. But you mentioned the C.S. Lewis quote when we were chatting okay. about um, about joy is the serious business of heaven. In chapter one, Paul is going to present a principle called our no lose situation. This is the one that stands out for Christians. Most of these principles can be applied by everybody, but this one is specific to those who've trusted Christ. And his no lose situation, remember he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, He was facing the possibility of death. Five years later, he's actually going to be beheaded. Uh, But in this situation, he always, he did not lose his joy in the face of death because he was in a no lose situation. He has been redeemed by Christ And therefore, he is going to get to spend eternity with Christ. So while he's here on earth, he's going to have an opportunity to live for Christ, but he's got a no-lose situation. And if Christians were to think about those things, as Paul tells us in Thessalonians, and remind ourselves and be encouraged that no matter where you're at today, no matter who's after you, what your circumstances are, what you have an opportunity to worry about, God has already put you in a no-lose situation. Your story is going to end, and it's going to be a great story. Ponder that and let your joy go up. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. And like you say in your book, Paul wrote about joy while he was in prison. Pastor Randy, thank you for this incredible book. I myself am taking the joy challenge and I'm not going to let any joy robbers or joy thieves steal my joy anymore. Thank you so much.
Well, thank th you. Uh, it's so good. To, uh, the, what, a, what a powerful and wonderful discussion. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then uh, Shane Winning, CEO of Promise Keepers, will be with us to share his vision for the future for Promise Keepers. We'll be right back. The barriers that stand between you and a blessed life may feel insurmountable, but Dr. Robert Jeffers assures you they can be overcome. This month, when you give your most generous gift to Cornerstone Television, we'll send you Dr. Jeffers' new book, Invincible, Conquering the Mountains That Separate You from the Blessed Life. Offering biblical insight and practical tools, he explains how you can conquer the hindrances of doubt, guilt, anxiety, discouragement, fear, and bitterness through prayer and faith in a God whose strength can move mountains. Request your copy when you support the gospel ministry of Cornerstone Television. Your generosity will evangelize the lost, encourage believers, provide excellent Bible teaching, and so much more. Call us today and become invincible, conquering the mountains that separate you from the blessed life. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving. Our next guest has an unwavering dedication to serving others, sharing the gospel, and living out his calling with purpose and passion. Shane Winnings is the CEO of Promise Keepers, and he joins us now to share how he plans to help the church be more effective in reaching, supporting, and growing courageous men of faith. I love that. Shane, welcome to Hope Today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Well, Shane, tell us your story. You have an interesting, we call, might call it the backstory, but you have an interesting story before you ever got to uh, being involved with, uh, with Promise Keepers. Could you tell us your story, maybe how you came to faith, but also the other things that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like many people, I grew up in the church. Um, even as a young boy, I was involved in the Awana program, you know, memorizing Bible verses, competing. Uh, I was a two-time state champion when I was like eight and nine years old. But what I found out was when I got to college and my faith was tested, uh, you know, I lived like everybody else. I was partying like everyone else. I was doing what everyone else was doing. And that would go on for seven years, even while I was drumming at a mega church. Now, during that time, I had been training to become an army officer, and I served with the 1st Special Forces Group. I uh, had a combat tour deployment to Afghanistan in 2014. And when I came back, I was just miserable. Uh, I wanted to end my life. You know, I'd lost friends. I'd lost soldiers that were under my command. Um, I was trying to party and do all these things to fill that void that I had. And God spoke to me one day, and I had a thought. And it, and it was, Shane, you've never lived for me a day in your life. Wow. And I had grown up in church for 25 years, but I knew immediately this was God and that he was right and that I had maintained a Christian confession, but I had not made him my master. You know, I'd made him only my savior. And I gave the Lord my life on my bedroom, uh, on my bed in my bedroom about eight and a half years ago, and everything changed. You know, I began to read and pray, and, and I wanted to do these things. And I began preaching on the streets uh, during my transition out of the military. I became a police officer. I was living south of Seattle, and I did that for five years. And I'd work at night as a cop. I'd preach on the street during the day. Um, when the lockdowns came uh, in 2020, I began preaching on social media. And within a year, gained over a million followers between TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. And God spoke to me again and said, hey, I want you to leave your job. I was making over six figures at the time. Become a missionary, travel the nation, and preach the gospel. And so my wife and I did that. We took that leap of faith. You know, she was four months pregnant, and we walked away from that six-figure salary and benefits to, to become missionaries. And during that time, I met the former CEO of Promise Keepers, Ken Harrison. We formed a relationship, and two and a half years later, he offered me the position, and now I'm more than honored to be serving as the CEO. Wow, yeah, we've had Ken on the program, but that is a quick turnaround. I mean, that is, yeah. a, that is coming from one place to another place in a short few years and through the, through the whole lockdown time as well. So... Um, you know, well, what's it like coming into this organization? And let's, let's be honest, most of the people my age remember Promise Keeper from the 90s. It's kind of the, right. the, the, the things that Amy talked about her dad and, and myself and the things we remember. And it was powerful and it was wonderful. But it's kind of gone out of our, uh, our, our focus right now. 
What is God doing uh, in new in Promise Keepers? Absolutely. You know, with any organization, um, as it changes hands, you know, some leaders are uh, better than others. Some leaders maintain the original vision. Some leaders try to take it a different direction. And I think what we saw being quite candid is that Promise Keepers began to lose track of its original vision that Coach McCartney had, which was simply to reach men for Jesus Christ and, and raise them up to be strong fathers husbands and citizens and we began to kind of adopt the social justice mission which was never the mission to begin with and as a result you saw people begin to disengage from promise keepers and uh you know basically it was on life support for a while ken came on he really brought it back up to a functional place you know even held an event in dallas in 2021 gathering over 35,000 men and so over the last few years we've been navigating the obstacles of culture and, you know, who will stand with us as we stand on biblical truth. And so I'm honored to be, you know, in this seat and we're going to begin gathering again uh, at least once a year. We're going to hold these gatherings that men remember from the 90s. Uh, we've got one coming up in, in just a little over a week and we're very excited to see what God will do. Shane, with this heart for men being great men of God and meeting Jesus and traveling the world, what is your pulse on the men in the country? What are you most excited about and what word do you have for them today? Yeah, you know, I think um, statistically even the, the Christian church has become the most feminized religion in the world. And I don't say that in any way to talk down about women. But the Bible calls men to be the spiritual leaders. And, you know, the joke is always, oh, my mom drugged me to church when I was a kid. And when you look at the stats in the country of fatherlessness, of, you know, un unexpected pregnancies, women are statistically alone in those situations. Where are the men? You know, when I was a cop picking up kids off the street who were riddled with bullet holes, it wasn't because they didn't have a strong mom in the home. It's because they didn't have dads. And so we believe in calling dads to stand up and uh, be equipped by the truth of God's word, which is eternal. And so I think as a nation, we've seen um, a form of suffering because of the absence or lack of Christian men, Christian fathers, Christian husbands. And at Promise Keepers, we're excited to engage these men who desperately need you know, to be strengthened in this time, because, you know, let's be honest, we're not living in the 90s anymore. Life is pretty tough, especially over the last few years. And so we could use some of that hope you guys were talking about in a previous segment. Yeah, for sure. The, 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 the whole thing of, uh, you know, where are the men? Well, let me ask you about that. Let me ask you about the nuts and bolts of what you want to do. How are you going to equip the church? You've got great goals. And I love the the heart for evangelism that's, uh, that's right at the heartbeat and should be at the heartbeat of, of Christians. Well, how do you plan to equip the, uh, the men of God? Yeah, well, one, you said it. We want to help equip the church. We love the church. We're not trying to take the church's place or uh, be better than anyone. We want to come alongside the church. In fact, the church is, a, is a, the body of Christ, right? It doesn't mean a building where people only meet on Sundays. And so we look at Promise Keepers as part of the church as well. And so we want to strengthen the local churches. We want to say, hey, send your men to a Promise Keepers event. We're going to strengthen them, equip them with dynamic speakers, with panels uh, that cover topics that are relevant to what we're going through. You know, even Billy Graham, one of the most famous preachers in the history of the world, he would often say, you know, I read in the paper today, and he would begin to preach a biblical worldview on current events. And that's what you can expect out of Promise Keepers. Hey, men, how can we help you navigate the world that you're living in today with biblical truths that were written thousands of years ago? And so through these dynamic catalytic conferences, like people remember Promise Keepers uh, for hosting, we'll continue to do those. But also we recognize, look, there's another 363 days in a year. And so we're launching weekly and monthly uh, Bible groups and men's hangouts. And we've also got a new digital uh, community, you know, similar to like a Facebook or something, except we own it. And we're really trying to connect men on a deeper level, as well as provide them resources, uh, curriculum. I mean, we're, we're trying to provide all of these things just to be another resource for men uh, to say, hey, you're not alone. We're with you. 
come experience, you know, and encounter God at one of our events, but also let us help you connect with other men in your area through some of our different platforms. Shane, uh, just real quick before we, uh, we go, how does someone get involved? What's the best pathway for a man to get involved in this? Yeah, you know, if you want to stay up to date, one, you can uh, go to promisekeepers.org. And at the bottom of the page, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, social media is always great. You know, we're very active on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but also, we've got events coming up. And so, like I said, we've got one uh, next Friday and Saturday in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's tickets still available. There's a sale going on tomorrow uh, through the 9th. Dads, if you buy a ticket, all of your boys get in for free. Wow. And so you can find all of that info at daringfaith.org. Daring Faith is the theme of our event, right? We need men who will live boldly and courageously in this hour. And so I'm, I'm really excited for that next weekend. And we'll have a link on ctvn.org to Daring Faith, uh, uh, the website as well. Shane uh, Winnings, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the vision you've got for Absolutely. Promise Keepers. Thank you, guys. Wow, uh, that, that's it's some exciting. great stuff going on. That yeah. is, that really is exciting. We need to share about that because there's a lot of people in Tulsa that we know and we're friends with. You know, thinking about life and circumstances and people and issues and problems. I mean, Tom, it can get overwhelming, but God has given us everything we need in the Bible to overcome and to win in our everyday life. Absolutely he has. I mean, we've talked about joy as, as being the stuff of, it's, the, it's what the, the Christianity is lived out. And men, you need to have those, be those joyful warriors that God has called you to be. We need the men of God. We need, and, and we don't all need everybody to be a preacher. Praise God for men of God that preach. But we need men of God that will just go to work, provide for their families, be a light in the, in the, uh, in the world that they work in, and just be solid pillars of the community. That is going to be so important in bringing, Amy, the, the word of God to this whole world. You know, I was just in Cuba for a week, and as I was there, I watched people with dire circumstances, poor, hungry, they're controlled, it's overwhelming, but they were so full of joy. So I pray today that you get your joy back, and remember, the joy of the Lord is your strength, and that'll bring you hope today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, find solace, purpose, and hope within life's struggles. Daystar founder and president Joni Lamb recounts how her faith in Christ has been the anchor throughout some of the greatest triumphs and losses in her life. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.